is Miriam Ortega, and I am the promotions coordinator for Calle 25 and Historic Capital Hill District. Uh, my name is Taz Nemo Michael. I just go by Taz because it's easier for everyone. Uh, I'm currently a legislative assistant for representatives Marilyn Bell and Chelsea Brano. My name is Risa Desmond. Um, I am a social studies, uh, sixth grade social studies teacher. So my name awesome. is Giovanna Medina. I am the director for the Domestic Violence Victims Assistance Program for the YWCA. Well, my name is Javier Hernandez. Um, I have been in the United States for 26 years of my 27 years of life. Um, currently at this law firm, at Lambert Dunn Associates, I handle uh, all of our immigration cases. Um, I arrived to the United States when I was 17 years old. Um, I was my parents decided to make the, the move over here because I got sick. I was diagnosed with something that uh, pretty much told my parents that I only had a couple months left to live. And when I, when I think about this, it, it really makes me think of you know, that reason and how much it took my parents to make the decision to leave their own family behind. I originally came here when I was um, going to turn two, about to turn two or so. Um, my family migrated from Mexico here and um, I've been here ever since. Um, you know, I went to um, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, and now I'm a teacher. And I've been here all my life and I don't know anything else but here. I really like to ask people what, if they remember when they had their first McDonald's meal. And my first McDonald's meal was attempting to cross the border when I was eight years old. And we were stopped by the uh, immigration officers. And it was like three in the morning and I was really, really hungry. And one of the immigration officers uh, got me my first McDonald's meal at the border. Uh, we go to San Jose, California. We're there for a few months. And then my parents decided to come to the state of Oklahoma. My immigration status was always something that I was very aware of. I initially found out I was not a citizen or resident of the United States when I was about 16 years old. I was 16 and I wanted to get my permit and stuff. And then my parents, you know, sit down and they're like, well, that can't happen because um, you're undocumented. And I was like, what? What does that mean? Like, what, am, what do you mean I'm undocumented? And, well, I mean, I kind of have an idea, but then I was like, I don't know what, what, like, what does all that consist of? Big difficulty really came when I started applying for colleges and you know, trying to get scholarships. I did understand that you know, I was undocumented, that I was unable to get the same scholarships. And I found out I couldn't apply for um, financial assistance or anything. I had to get my own private scholarships, which was fine because I got a few and stuff, you know. But at the end, I was so discouraged the fact that I had to sign a waiver for this, waiver for that, because I was undocumented, because I was this, I was that. And it was so discouraging. And then driving. I mean, driving was one of the most frightening things, you know, ever in the world. Uh, just, I could get pulled over, and if I, if I, you know, just didn't put off a good presence, or if for some reason I had a bad encounter, I could be deported back to Mexico at any time. My parents did try not to drive. Uh, probably the one place we drove the most was to church, um, and then them to their jobs. I would take the bus to school. I didn't drive. I didn't drive when I was 16. My parents were scared and I, you know, didn't drive myself. And I, you know, would Uber everywhere or, or taxi, <laughs> use a taxi back in the day. But it was in 2012 when President Obama's executive order came through. I remember and, uh, it was June of 2012. And I remember I was on my way to school to a triple C when they made the announcement. You know, when I found out, I was like, really? Like, am I gonna be able to get a social security? Like, am I gonna be able to work? Like, is this really gonna happen? I have no. And I had like all these missed phone calls uh, from people and I was like, I don't know what's going on because I had been at work and I couldn't check my phone. So I get into my car and that's what they were talking about in the break deal. I think there's something going on. There's a catch here. Oh, there's a catch. This is the and they started like all this announcement, like lawyers, like apply for DACA, you know, this and that, yeah. and then this and that, and then, oh my gosh, it was just like, what? And I was like, oh my God, and it was like this excitement, right? Like, they passed a dream act. That's what we all thought, that it was a dream act, and that it was gonna be a chance for all of us to finally get the chance, right, to adjust our status. Finally gave me that driver's license, 
that social security number that allowed me to work and just gave me an ease of mind. And then I received my card and I was like, oh, hey, macaroni, are you serious? <laughs> this is, is this real? I, I still remember, I mean, everybody was so happy. My family was just thrilled. And it was just after so many closed doors and very frequently throughout my senior year, it was like you finally see, saw the light under the tunnel. I, is, is this me in this car? This is, you know, even though it's just like you can't, uh, leave the country, you can't do none of that, and this is not proof of citizenship or permanent residence of the United States, but it said United States and I could be able to work and I was like, oh my god, and then later on I got my social security and then I was able to get my driver's license and then I was able to like apply and my first job I applied for was a bank. We're in limbo, uh, that's the easy way to say it. We don't know what's going to happen. It could be tomorrow, it could be next week, but they could just say, okay, DACA is no longer, you can't renew after tomorrow, and if that happens, well then, we're all just back to square one. I remember when he, when it was announced that I, I was so angry, because I feel like for the first time in, in such a long time, I was able to have a little bit more certainty about what was gonna happen to my life, and at that moment, you know, it, it, it went back to square one. You didn't know. And that's how my whole life has been. You, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know if your parents are going to come home. There's no new applications. So that's, to me, that's very sad because I see so much potential, especially as a teacher, um, seeing these students be able to do something with their lives and they can't because of that. And I know what it feels like because I was in high school and graduated without DACA. So people are like, why don't you apply for citizenship? Yes. <laughs> I'm just like, well, I can't apply for citizenship. Trust me, if I could, I would. Like, that's something that I would not doubt. In a heartbeat, I would. Like, that's something I want with my life. You know, it's 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 difficult. It's difficult. So, definitely, we would have had the, the choice to do everything and, and have the money and the resources to do it. We would have. I, I don't think we would have left our home country. So, a lot of the misconceptions circles back on, on, on why, why it's done and really understand the process. It's, it's a difficult process that requires a lot of resources that we didn't have. Or just like another question, just like, why don't you pay taxes? I pay you taxes, I pay a lot of taxes. Um, you know, I'm a contributing member just like everybody else. I pay my income and my sales and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and my answer to a lot of people of just like, you know, well, how, how do we make you a citizen? What do we do? Well, there needs to be like a federal legislative solution. People have preconceived notions of what undocumented people are and that's what they believe. And so changing the narrative, we're not criminals, this is the data, and this is the impact we can have. If you are DACA, if you're not DACA, if you're completely undocumented, if you're a U.S. citizen, a resident, whoever you are, um, I think it's important to understand that we are humans. I think the best way is, is for everyone to get educated, to understand the process of citizenship and what it means to have DACA and and really get in touch with people with real people that have DACA and hear from them. I think you're never going to get anything better than a one on one conversation with actual with actual facts, actual truth about people's stories. Especially nowadays that we have social media, they need to learn, be informed about it. You know, listen, um, I know they have, everybody has their point of view and everybody has their right to have that. If you listen to other like, people's stories, um, you know, with actually an open heart, not just listening to reply, but to actually grasp it and take it in. So it's important to learn our stories, their stories, and share in their stories more than anything. Kind of share those emotions and, and kind of be a part of what they're going through if you really believe in, in what, the, what they are and who they are. And so keep the hope up. Right now it might be hard times, but who knows later. Like, Try to be good, stay out of trouble, you know, not because like, well, I can't do nothing anymore. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, can't go to college, can't do this because I'm undocumented. No, no, keep your hope up. Um, that hard work will pay at one point. That, all that good stuff they ever do, it's gonna, it's gonna pay at one point. So keep the hope up because 
hope is the last thing that dies to me. And you know, um, they, there can be anything can happen, anything. 